I'm really looking forward to next week starting this new sermon series, Jesus is Enough, a study in the book of Colossians. I'm really excited because next week Jacob gets to preach and he's going to kick it all off. And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, this will be the first time that I have done a sermon series in tandem. And we've had to figure out who's going to do seven weeks down the road. And uh, so we've all got, we've got it all divided, and we've got it div uh, divided in the book, and then divided between who's going to preach what. And uh, so this is going to be a challenge for, for me and for uh, us, and, uh, but I'm really looking forward to it because God has so much to say in the book of Colossians to his church, and, and so much is applicable to, to us today. All of it is, but uh, I'm really looking forward to what God has to teach us. But first things first, uh, this is the last Sunday of our April Emphasis of World Missions. And um, so I want to keep your attention attracted in that, uh, in that vein. Um, around our sanctuary for several months now, you've seen these flags, right? And imagine, maybe if you're a visitor, you're wondering, what in the world are these flags doing in the, in, inside the sanctuary. Maybe if you're a regular, you say, every year they bring out these flags. What in the world are these flags for? Well, these flags um, represent the ones you see, 14 different countries. Matter of fact, we're gonna go around the room and you help me figure out who, what they are, okay? Can you do that? If I'm gonna point to a flag and you tell me what country it represents. Yell it out really loud uh, because I can't hear you otherwise, all right? I really do think I need a hearing aid and I'm gonna work on that, but that's for another day. Okay, this flag right here. Russia, that flag. Everybody got that one. Yes, France. The next one down there. Mm. Mm. Not yet, no, that one's down there. I think it's uh, Taiwan or Formosa, okay? The one after that, gold, white, green. Where? Ireland has the same colors but different order. That's the Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast. The red one with the yellow stars. China. The next one, I can't see it from here. That's Spain. The one by the clock to the left of the clock, Cuba, the one to the right of the clock, Japan, we all got Japan, the Hersey's thank you for getting that one right. <laughs> then after Japan is Panama, that's the Panamanian one, after Panama is Mexico, the blue and white stripes with the sunshine is Uruguay, after Uruguay right here with the little wheel. India, oh, who knows this one here? That's Haiti, right, it's Haiti. <laughs> that close, one little border, that's Haiti. And then the last one over here, if you're a soccer fan, you know this one? Brazil, right. And you know that not all of the flags that Free Will Baptists, that all the flags that represent countries uh, that Free Will Baptists are working in are represented here. If you got one of these on the back table, and, and uh, I would suggest you pick one up, there are over 20, we got 20 little medallions that represent the flags. 20 on this, this particular thing that shows other countries that Free Will Baptists are ministering, like Uzbekistan, Vietnam, Pakistan, Myanmar, uh, Mongolia, Morocco, uh, and there are more than that. Now, we don't have a, a native expatriate North American missionary in all those countries, but we have partners that we're laboring with, that minister with us and for us in partnership. But all, why the flags? That's my question. Why flags? I want you to think about it just for a second. Why the flags? These flags represent people. People in these countries who are infinitely important to God. It's good to take our eyes off ourselves from time to time and face the reality that Americans are not the only people God is interested in. 
That's why we put up the flags. And I'll go one step further. Even beyond the flags, beyond the geopolitical units we call countries that have borders and governments and rules and laws, there are people groups within these political boundaries we call countries who have distinctive cultures and languages for whom there is no flag, no representation in the global political community who care about them as a, as a people. They're the Berber who, who travel through the Atlas Mountains in Western, the, the Western Sahara, Morocco, and other countries. The, the Kurds. The Kurds who are scattered through Turkey and Syria and Iran and Iraq and have no country of their own, but they've got their own culture and their own language. In Burkina Faso, tiny little country north of Ivory Coast in the west part of Africa. In Burkina Faso, there's 77% of the, the national Burkina Fasoans, I don't know how they pronounce themselves, 77% of them are Gur, G-U-R, from, from a tribe. 8% are Fulani, 6% are Mande, 5% are Jula, 3% are Malinke, so even if you have a flag that represents a country of people, inside those countries there are people groups with their own culture and their own language and their own distinctives. Those who map these groups say there's 16,587 people groups in the world of a certain size. That's a, that's a group that has a distinctive cultural linguistic combination of people who see themselves as us and see everybody else as them, even within their own country. We're told that of those 16,587 people groups, 7,162, there's going to be a test on this, so you need to write down these numbers, okay? Just kidding. 7,162 are unreached people groups. That means there's not an evangelical church in that group strong enough to support itself and multiply itself to the borders of that people group. And of those 7,162 unreached people groups, there are 418 what we call unengaged. Those groups of 40,000 or more that have absolutely no gospel witness. So here's the bottom line for us to sink our teeth and, and get our minds into this whole concept we call missions. We live in a huge diverse world and there are lots of thems in the world that I don't really spend a lot of time thinking about and neither do you. Why should it interest me? Why should it be of a concern to me? Why should it be a concern to me if the thems around the world have an opportunity to hear the same gospel that I heard and the same gospel that changed my life? Why should sending missionaries to tell them be a priority in my prayer life and in my pocketbook? Why should I be willing to say to God, here is my child. If you want him, if you want her to use him or her to take the gospel to those who have never heard, to an unreached or an unengaged people group, why should that matter? Now let me suggest a couple of reasons why it shouldn't matter. It's not because it's the humanitarian thing to do. It's not for the purpose of extending our Western values and culture. It's not because we can't stand to see those, those commercials of starving babies. Here's why. Missions, taking the gospel of Jesus to all peoples, literally tumbles out of Scripture from virtually every page. I've studied it a lot. I've lived it a lot. 
And although there are many ways to look at the biblical theology of missions that comes out of Scripture from Genesis to Revelation, I... Well, I found a really interesting way to do it that's really simple to remember. You can divide, you can distill it down to, to uh, uh, three main arguments that compel God's church to be a missionary church and should compel each follower of Jesus to be a missionary Christian. And today we're only going to do one of those three. Aren't you glad about that? And of that one we're going to do, we're only going to do one-third of it. Aren't you glad about that? Say yes. Okay. The first reason we should be a missionary church, that as a follower of Christ, I should be a missionary Christian, is because of the condition of the world. One word. Lost. The condition of the world. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. There is none, no one righteous, no not one. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There, those who are in the flesh, that's you and me and all those thems out there, cannot please God. Just a little sidelight, I'd love to preach on this sometime soon too. Also, also um, this is my personal opinion that there's a direct correlation between the degree to which missions is ignored in the evangelical church and the increasing opinion among those in evangelical churches that those who have never heard are not really lost. God will do something to take care of them, even if they've never heard, even if they follow Allah, even if they follow Buddha, if they follow Confucius. God will take care of them somehow. His grace is sufficient. And the degree to which we increasingly believe that in the evangelical church is the same in inverse proportion, the degree to which missions is a forgotten subject. Because if they're not lost, why spend our time and our money and our resources? The condition of the world. The first great biblical reason why missions should be important to us is they're lost. Here's the second reason. The commands of Christ. The condition of the world, lost. The, commissions of, the commands of Christ, go. Go. Clear and definite word at least five times in the, in the Gospels in the book of Acts. One that, that we read already this morning. Jesus says to the church five times after his, his resurrection and before he ascended into heaven, he made sure he gave the last marching orders to, to his people who were following him that this is what needs to be number one on your priority list. Go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. Go therefore. Mark says, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Luke says, repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, beginning from Jerusalem. John said, as the, John had quoted Jesus saying, as the Father sent me, so send I you. And then the passage we read, you will receive power after the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, even to the uttermost parts of the earth. It's impossible to follow the plea of Paul to present our bodies a living sacrifice and to ignore at the same time the clear and obvious commission of the Savior to go until all people hear. But those, are, I'm not going to preach on those two today. Here's the third one that I'm going to preach on. The character of God condition of the world, it's lost. The commands of Christ go. The character of God, what it is about the character of God that compels me to be a missionary follower, a missionary Christian, is a great book that I read 
in seminary called Biblical Theology of Missions by George Peters. And on the first page of the second chapter, he quotes uh, a theologian named Spears, Robert Spears. I wanted to read it to you. It's so good. I don't, don't want to mess it up. If the Great Commission had never been spoken by Jesus, or if having been spoken, it, they had not been preserved, the missionary duty of the church would not be in the least affected. The supreme arguments for missions are not found in any specific words. It's in the very being and character of God that the deepest ground of missionary enterprise is to be found. We cannot think of God except in terms which necessitate the missionary idea. What is it about God that compels us to be a missionary church? What is it about him that's different from any other God that people follow? What is it different about, different about him? Uh, what is it about him that's different from who we are? The very nature of God necessitates the missionary idea. Every attribute of God, moral attribute, uh, 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 the, the holiness of God, the love of God, and his, his literal attributes, screams, I want to know and be known by my creation. Missions, taking the gospel to those who have no other way of knowing the gospel unless someone goes and tells them is the very heartbeat of God. He wants to know and be known by every part of his creation. Telling the lost how they can be found is the task God has given to his followers. I believe missions is in my father's heart. We could start at Genesis and go all the way through Revelation but obviously time prevents us from doing that. So just one small example. I want us to go to the most familiar Bible passage known to all men, believer and non-believers, the book of John, the Gospel of John, chapter 3. John, chapter 3. In the Gift Bible, it's on page 888. 888. That's where you find the third chapter of John. John is the fourth of the Gospels that begin the New Testament. You probably don't even have to look at this. We could probably quote it together. If you want to try, you can try. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Before I read the, the larger context, 14 to 21, let me set the stage of what was going on here because it's really important. It's nighttime. There's a man who has heard about Jesus. He thinks maybe there's something to it. His miracles, his teaching, uh, uh, after which people stand in amazement and awe at what he had to say that was so different than, than the elders. And he wants to have a conversation with Jesus. But he wants to have it at night because he doesn't want anybody else to know about it. His name is Nicodemus. He's the leader, a leader in the Jewish Pharisaic uh, uh, group of, uh, of, of people who have who set themselves aside as religious leaders. Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night and he asks him a question. And then Jesus must think the question is irrelevant because he doesn't answer the question. Jesus does that a lot through the Gospels because he knows what's really in people's hearts and so they ask some, some question to, obfuse, uh, to, 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 to mask what they're really thinking about and, and uh, he goes right to, the, right to the juggler as it were. He goes to the point and he knows what Nicodemus is really concerned about and he says to him, if you want to be a part of the kingdom of God, you're going to have to be born again. And Nicodemus, case okay, thinking physical, right? He said, how can I be born again? I can be born twice physically. It's possible. You can't get in, go into your mother's womb a second time. And Jesus said, no, no I'm talking about spiritual, spiritual birth, not physical birth. And, Jesus, and Nicodemus says a second time, well, how does that happen? What's, what are you talking about, spiritual birth? And to that, Jesus rebukes him. He rebukes him. He says, you are so slow. 
On Wednesday night, we saw another passage. Jesus said to his own disciples, you are so dull. You're dim-witted. I've been with you all this time. You don't understand? Nicodemus, you're this wise, religious guy, and you don't understand what I'm saying? He said, you don't understand the physical things that you can see. How in the world are you going to understand the spiritual things you can't see? And then we get to verse 14, and I want to read verse 14 through 21. As Moses, this is Jesus talking to Nicodemus at night, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. And then our text, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment that the light has come into the world. And men loved the darkness rather than the light. For their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light. And does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light. So that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. Jesus makes a reference to an historical event that every Jew knew about. Every Jew knew about it because Moses wrote it down in the Torah. The people of Israel had come out of slavery in Egypt. They were in the wilderness and they were complaining and they're backbiting and bickering about how God was or was not taking care of them. And God sent a judgment in the midst of his people of snakes, poisonous snakes, because of their disobedience. And some were bitten and those who were bitten were dying. And God told Moses to make an image of a snake out of bronze and lift it high up on a, a pole and then tell the people that if they would only look at the image of the snake that they would live. And it, it came about as he said. And Jesus right here with Nicodemus was looking back at that moment and he says this was a direct prophecy that was pointing to Messiah to the way Messiah would be lifted up on a pole to give his life, and everybody who looked, who believed on him, would be saved. Of course, Jesus knew he was talking about himself, but it was not clearly understood at this point that he was referring to himself. Nonetheless, the condition of salvation was made clear. Faith. Not works. And then in the explanation that follows after that allusion to, to what Moses had done and how that was pointing to Messiah, in the explanation, three words stand out to me that explain what it was about God that moves him to provide salvation, to lift up Messiah so people can live for lost mankind. What part of his character will move him to be lifted up upon a cross, dying in the place of those who stood condemned because of their sin? Two of the, these words are direct words describing the character of God. And the third identifies what he wants to give us that in a later text we find out is also a characteristic of God. Let me just give them to you. God is love. God is light, and God is life. It's very clear, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The characteristic of God is, 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 is embedded in that word love. And he is the light, attracting people to himself, dispelling the darkness of sin. He's light, and he's life. It doesn't say he's life, but it says he'll give life. And then later on in John 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. We could spend a whole lot of time talking about those three things, and, but I'm only going to talk about one of those today. Here's the one-third of the one-third. God is love. 1 John 4, 8 says, God is love. 
1 John 4, 16. And we have known and believed the love that God has for us. John 4, 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. We all know about love, don't we? It's common human emotion. There were some kids that were one time asked about uh, some kids in the elementary school level, uh, how the, you could tell if two people that they saw in a restaurant were in love. Uh, Bart, who was age nine, said, well, if they're in love, they'll just be staring at each other and their food will get cold. Other people who aren't in love care more about their food. Sandra age seven, said, oh, it's easy to tell who's in love in a restaurant. The man will have lipstick on his face. Christine, age nine, said, if they love each other, they order one of those desserts that gets set on fire. He said, they like to order those because that's how their hearts are. Their hearts are on fire. Pretty smart for a little girl at age nine. A love is when we, we, we feel all gushy and mushy inside, isn't it? It's, it's when we have those warm, tender emotions for something or the deep desire of someone or, or deep desire for something like pizza with ham and mushrooms and onions or lemon sorbet or bacon or apple pie with cheddar cheese, or vanilla ice cream if you're American, or new fallen snow, or brown paper packages tied up with string, right? Of course, I'm, I'm being facetious. And I don't mean to insult your intelligence. We talk about those kind of things being love. But we have experienced deep, abiding, emotional and physical attachment that we call love, haven't we? Well, I don't know how to tell you this, but nothing, nothing of what you've experienced that you have labeled love compares to the love with which the Father loves you and every other human that draws breath. The closest perhaps would be the love that a parent has for a child. But even that falls short of God's love for his creation. Commenting on this passage, John 3.16, J.I. Packer said, John is trying to explain that the love that God has for men is totally unlike the love that man might have for one another. It's part of his, whole, of his very nature to love an unlovable lost creation. And these are my parentheses describing what Packer is going to say here. And he, Packer is going to describe the difference between God's love and man's love. He says, love among men is awakened by something in the beloved. What's he mean by that? In other words, he says, we tend to love when the person we love awakens something in us that wants to reach out and respond. It's a, a mutual thing going on. It's very hard to love when that love is not returned. Unrequited love ends usually in disappointment, disaster sometimes. This is J.I. Packer again. But the love of God is free, spontaneous, unevoked, uncaused. God loves men because he has chosen to love them. This text that we all know by heart suggests that God's love, God's choice to love, drives him to do the unthinkable. And that's what we call the good news. God loved 
our sinful race so much that he sent his son. It's clear in the text, isn't it? For God so loved, he gave. But here's the rest of the story. It's also clear in the text. His love is the solution to a terrible problem. Condemnation. Man is condemned already because of sin. Even though mankind is loved by God, he rests condemned. Though he loves unconditionally, though God loves the race that he created unconditionally, he, he's not required to love us because we evoked something in our wonderful demeanor that caused him to love us. Though he loves unconditionally, he will not, he cannot forgive and accept us except on the basis of Jesus' sacrifice. For to do so would be to betray the integrity of God's own holy character. The cross is proof of God's love and man's response determines whether he will perish or not. Without the cross, the Christian message would be logically incoherent. It would be as shallow as the love of a person who always accepts another person's destructive behavior without calling him or her to account. This is the good news. That God's love in Christ forgives, transforms, and empowers those loved to righteous and compassionate living. So, there are two essential conditions for experiencing God's love. Jesus' death on the cross, costly grace, and our self-committing trust, genuine faith. Let me say that one more time because that's, if, it all, if it's everything else disappears, <laughs> we need to stand on this, okay? There are two essential conditions for experiencing that love with which God loved us. Jesus' death on the cross, which is grace, and our self-committing trust, which is faith. Apart from God's grace, we can do nothing to save ourselves. Our works can never save us. Clear as, clear as can be through scripture. But this does not mean that salvation is unconditional. Jesus shows us the true nature of love and its breathtaking cost. You see, divine love, the love with which the Father loved us, is that dynamic by which God moves outside himself to communicate and impart himself to a lost creation. The ultimate and necessary communication of divine love is his sacrifice as payment of man's debt. John said it again in his epistle, in this is manifested the love of God toward us, that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. That's just another way of saying John 3.16. This is love. God sent his son so that you don't have to be condemned, but you can live forever. How? By looking up at that cross. Like the Israelites did in, with the snake in the wilderness. In St. Paul's Cathedral in London, there's a statue of the Christ in agony on the cross. And below it, there's an inscription. And it says, This is how God loved the world. So you ask, so I thought you were going to preach a missions message. Sounds like a simple call to salvation to me. Well, you see, 
the focus of God's love has always been the world. Cosmos. Not the physical globe, not the earth, although he does love his entire creation. The context here specifically draws our attention to the fact that it's people. The people of the world. The people that the world contains, mankind. The context makes it crystal clear. Even when he focused his attention on guiding and providing for the Jewish nation, it was always for the purpose of providing a Messiah for the nations, the ethne in the Greek, the people groups. In Psalm 67.1 we read, God, this is a prayer of Israel, God be gracious to us and bless us. Cause your face to shine upon us that your way may be known on the earth and your salvation among all nations. Even those who are tuned in understood it then. Lord, love us so that the nations will see and believe. The character of God is that his love is reaching out to all peoples. It always has been. It has never stopped. And Jesus' death on the cross was to provide salvation for whoever responds to that love and the act of love that is ultimately supremely representative of that love. And those two unchangeable truths compel his church to be a missionary church. It isn't enough that God loves them. They must respond to that love by faith in Jesus Christ. We must make sure that everyone for whom Jesus died and to whom he extends the possibility of salvation has an opportunity to respond to that offer. And that part of his character that loves, that compels those who love him to make sure others know that they are also loved and that there is a response to that love that is necessary. That's the mission's message for today. He loves us. But he loves them too. And the love will be of none effect in terms of their eternal destiny unless they respond to that love. Just like you and I responded to his love.